All right. So welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this uh, live tech talk. Um, today, we have a session on uh, multi-table transactions with Lake, F Lake FS and Delta Lake. So I wanted to mention that this is part of the Data Plus AI online meetup group. So if you're joining us on YouTube or LinkedIn, um, I'll send the link to our meetup group in both of those chat spaces. I'd love you for you to join the group. Um, that's where you'll be updated on all the upcoming sessions. Um, and you can join the Zoom broadcast if you'd like and um, interact with us there. So uh, also too, if you're joining us on Zoom, um, I invite you to check out our YouTube channel. Um, so that has all of the recordings of all of our tech talk sessions. So I do, I have a playlist there that um, has specifically, you know, the events that we run on the meetup group. Um, and then we also have like recorded sessions from um, the Data Plus AI Summit and also a lot of other awesome um, videos and, and technical sessions there too. So I invite you to check that out and then um, join us on LinkedIn if you'd like to. Uh, so I wanted to give a quick shout out. We have a podcast series, and Denny's actually one of is one of the co-hosts, along with Brooke Wenig from Databricks. Um, they're on their second season. So if you're into podcasts and you want to learn about machine learning, um, I invite you to check that out. So it's available wherever you like to get your podcasts. And same thing, um, when I'm done with my intro slides, I'll put the link in the chat so you guys can um, check it out. And then we have a guest blog program. So um, I invite you to check out this page. Um, we're looking, we want to see what you're working on. And if you're interested in writing, um, you know, even if you're a beginner, you haven't written any blog posts, but you have something you'd like to share, I invite you to reach out to me. So um, you all can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. I'm help manage this program. Um, or you're also welcome to submit your idea um, through, through that web page. So there's more information there um, if you'd like to kind of check it out and um, think about writing. I'd love to hear from you. And then one other program I wanted to share, um, we just launched it a few weeks. Um, we're really excited about it. It's called the Databricks Beacons. Um, these are all individuals in the community um, and it's our way of saying thank you and um, sharing the awesome things that they're doing, their contributions. Um, a lot of them write blog posts. A lot of them do videos. Uh, they share um, they write books, uh, they teach, uh, some of them are in our University Alliance program, uh, but really these are members of the community and it's it's our way of recognizing the awesome um, work that they're doing um, related to Databricks and the open source projects, including Spark, Delta Lake, uh, MLflow. Um, so I invite you to check out the page that we have on our website. And um, we have profile pages of all of them so you can see their websites, their books, um, lots of awesome content, lots of um, technical materials to help you learn about um, Databricks and our open source projects. Uh, and also too, we're looking for community nominations. So if you see somebody or you know of somebody in the community um, that's doing great work, um, you know, could be organizing meetups, giving tech talks, um, mentoring, answering questions on Stack Overflow or forums, um, please reach out. Uh, I manage this program. So again, you can, um, you, I welcome uh, messages on LinkedIn, or again, you can visit the page and kind of check out more about the program and um, submit a nomination if you'd like to. All right, and with that, my intro slides are done. And uh, just a quick reminder that this session will be recorded. So uh, it'll be available on YouTube right after we're, we're finished. Um, so I'll drop that link in the chat spaces as well. Um, so you all have it if you'd like to view the session at a later date. So with that, I'll pass it over to Denny and Paul. Thank you very much. All right, let's see if I can present my screen. Um, that would always be helpful in the presentation last time I checked. So let's do that. All right, so we have slides. Go figure. Hi, everybody. Uh, just in case you forgot what session you're in, uh, it's multi table transactions with LakeFS and Delta Lake. Um, Paul and myself had already chatted a little bit, but by the same token, we want to know who, if you want to know who we are. My name is Denny. I'm a developer advocate at Databricks, a longtime geek at Databricks, and before that, I was at Microsoft uh, building really large scale systems. I was part of SQL Server and, um, uh, <clears throat> and other groups there. So Hopefully I can be provide some technical context uh, or at least play really want, really well on TV here. Um, if you wanna know more about Delta Lake, by all means, please check out O'Reilly's Delta Lake, the Definitive Guide early release. Uh, the early release is the first few chapters of the book. Uh, you can use this link. We'll also send it to you in Zoom and LinkedIn. 
and YouTube. Hopefully YouTube will work. Um, but the link is right there. Uh, yes, a little biased that of the book because I'm uh, glad to say I'm one of the co-authors of the book. So nevertheless, Paul, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Paul. Very excited to be here. I am also a developer advocate at uh, but at PlayGFS. Uh, I previously um, led a platform engineering team at Equinox Fitness, uh, where I worked on a number of what I would describe as operational and user-facing analytic projects or services. Uh, and a little about me outside of work, I like to run, golf, play ping pong, and backgammon. Perfect. Thank you. So, all right, we're going to dive right into it. So there's a bunch of like fun slides and providing some context in terms of what is the promise of a data lake. Okay. And the context here basically is that, you know, when we, especially because I was actually part of the team that was actually had created um, what is now known as Azure HD Insight. I was uh, where we're saying, hey, you know, we were pitching the idea of the promise of the data. Lake. And I, I just come from the SQL Server team and we're saying like, yeah, yeah, we need to put everything in data lake. We can't, put everything in a structured SQL database. It just can't work anymore. We can't distribute it. You know, none of that funky stuff, right? So let's, that's it. Let's collect everything. Let's store it all. And then because we store it all, bam, we can do data science machine learning and we're done, right? Everything is solved by putting everything on data lake and everything's fixed and everything's cool, right? Um, so if you, I'm uh, presuming because I'm presenting, I can't tell if anybody's raising their hands, but if I could see you, I hopefully you're grinning and wincing in pain with that statement I just made. You're going like, what? No, dude, that's not even remotely close because the problem is garbage in, garbage out, right? That's ultimately the problem, right? You, you collect everything that's great, but you're also potentially collecting garbage. And in fact, not even potentially, you usually are, okay? So what does a typical data lake project look like, right? If, if you're, you're you, we, we dream that dream of the data lake, right? Okay, well, the evolution of cutting edge data lake is like, okay, I've got events that are coming into, I'm just using Kafka as an example. This is not a knock on anybody else, just happen to use Kafka, all right? So I'm, I'm gonna use Spark to do streaming analytics. I'm gonna go ahead and use Spark to go ahead and store the data for your data lake because I need to be able to differentiate between my streaming data and my historical data. Well, then that means, boom, I gotta create a Lambda architecture, okay? The whole premise of that is basically, I need to go ahead and have two streams to process the same set of data, one for historical purposes and one for streaming purposes, okay? And then I'll run yet another Spark job to take the data from the data lake and then for AI reporting. Yay, that's easy, right? Again, sarcasm, okay? So, but then because you have this, right, you need to do data validation because you wanna make sure any of the processing that's done within your Lambda architecture, the streaming, actually matches the data that's being processed in your batch, right? You wanna make sure these two are matching. Otherwise you're gonna be reporting different data, which would be really, really bad, okay? But then how about if there are mistakes and failures to this process, right? Okay, so, okay, well, I'm gonna partition my data in my data lake. I'm gonna reprocess the data in my data lake and then no problem at all. I'll just reprocess the data and everything's solved. So no problem, okay? Everything's fixed, right? but then I need to do updates. Okay, well, that means I need to run updates and merge against my data lake. And if you're using uh, traditional distributed systems, whether it's Spark or anything else, updates or merges typically mean running massively large select statements, insert statements, and basically yourself manually merging all this stuff together, right? This is can get really ugly uh, and complicated to run. And then you have to schedule properly to avoid any modifications to the uh, uh, underlying AI reporting that you wanna do until the data is actually ready. Okay, so this seems a little complicated, all right? Uh, and because it is, right? And you basically, the context, you're wasting time and money, you're solving systems problems. You're actually not solving your data problems now, right? And you're not extracting the value from your data. That's, you're not doing these things. And so what the big problems, when it comes to data lakes in general, is that there's no atomicity, i.e. there's no, when you, and this is coming, the reason I brought up the database thing wasn't just because I was trying to say like, ooh, I we used to work for SQL Server. The reason I called it up is because when we went ahead and shifted from databases to data lakes, we thought the data lakes would solve some of our problems. And we summarily forgot all about the fact that this is concept of asset transactions that we got used to working with databases that would protect our data. And we forgot all about that. So there's no atomicity here. So that means when your production jobs fail and they invariably will, 
right? You, you've got a lot of orphan files and you have to clean those up somehow, right? And you have to know which files to clean up. And then there's no quality enforcement because there's actually no mechanism of saying, okay, this table schema is supposed to be these columns with those strings and ints or whatever else. None of that's actually in play here, right? And there's no consistency or isolation. So the key call here, no acid transactions, okay? So that's what OSS Delta Lake does, okay? And provides you that acid transaction protection for your data lake. In addition to that, those handle does scalable metadata handling, time travel that allows you to basically revert to earlier versions of the data. So in case there are issues, you can go back in time and get that. It's an open format, so that way you're actually you leveraging Apache Parquet against Delta Lake. Delta Lake itself is OSS, right? And it allows you to do unified batch and streaming. And in fact, my demo in a couple of in a couple of minutes will be exactly that, where we're showcasing that actually in action. Okay. And then as we noted about schema just a couple of slides before, right? The idea is that you can enforce the schema to protect your data yet at the same time, allow it to evolve when it's appropriate. So sometimes it is appropriate to let your data like say, table X does need to actually add an additional two columns, but you get to control that process as opposed to the system arbitrarily running over it, okay? And then remember how I talked about update, merge, uh, and then for that matter, deletes, right? DML operations, data modification language mod operations. The ability for is Delta Lake uh, gives you that ability to do that. So basically extending the Scala, SQL, and Python APIs uh, of Spark, it allows you to go do that. And it's 100% compatible to the Apache Spark APIs and audit history. I sort of called that out in the transaction uh, with the time travel. The idea is that there's a detailed log that tracks everything that's ever happened to your table. That's great. But I've been also very Spark centric. Okay. And that's a really key important aspect of Delta Lake. Yes, Delta Lake came from Spark. So we're very proud of that heritage. But that isn't where we're going. We're, we're not limit, we're not at all limited there. Okay. The the, the, as part of a roadmap, we just just published two weeks ago, right? There's the Delta standalone reader, Delta standalone writer. These allow you to go ahead and actually um, read and write, not using Spark at all. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, I did not include it here because it's actually already released before. But there's already the Delta Rust API. Okay, and the Delta Rust API actually uh, uh, created by the community allows you to interact with uh, using Rust. Uh, and then also it has Python bindings and they're still working on the Ruby and Golang bindings. But the idea is that you have multiple languages that can go talk to it, right? And so we also have Flink Delta source, i.e. Flink will be able to read from Delta, but that's currently targeted for Q4, uh, calendar year Q4. And the Flink to Delta sync, which means Flink can write to Delta, we're currently targeting Q1 of, uh, of early next year, right? Pulsar, the same thing, Apache Pulsar, uh, Spark 3.2 support, uh, Hive 3 connector. Uh, by the way, there was just an, um, a, a pull request for Beam, so that was pretty cool too, all right? And, and the, uh, there's uh, Nessie integration as well, and of course, LakeFS, which we're absolutely showcasing today, because this is an important aspect to us that, you know, we've made, Delta production and scalable utilizing Spark, but to make it accessible to everybody, it's super important. And so that uh, th that we are able to get the Delta ecosystem to work with every system out there that isn't Spark. And that's precisely why we're talking in these sessions like this. And by the way, if you're interested, join the Delta Slack users a group, uh, Delta user Slack group, excuse me. We actually have community meetings every two weeks. Uh, I've called out Trino, Flink, Nessie, LakeFS, Pulsar, Rust, and Core right now. Oh yeah, I did forget to put Presto inside here. So yes, there's actually, <laughs> Presto actually has the same timeline as here too, by the way. So my bad on forgetting that slide, <laughs> but that's the call out. We have a lot of cool things. And so now obviously I wanna go ahead and talk more about the, the Lake LakeFS is ability for us to do multi-table transactions. Now, for, we're gonna talk initially about single table consistency first, okay? And so that's what the purpose of this demo that we're gonna showcase now. Uh, super quick, because I want the I definitely wanna showcase, um, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what Paul's doing. Oh, sorry, I just nearly clicked on leave the meeting by accident. <laughs> that would have been really bad. Okay, so. Uh, this notebook is available. By the way, I got a ping from some folks. I apologize for having me an answer, but you know, currently presenting. Uh, but for both the slides as well as this notebook 
are going to be publicly available. We're going to attach it to both the LinkedIn and to the YouTube. And also there's a Databricks Tech Talks um, GitHub repo, which we put all of the stuff in. So you can absolutely get used to all of this, okay? So, all right, so this notebook, uh, I'm just gonna skip past this part. We're, we just simply had, to, to give you some context, we had a set of data. Uh, it's a loan by state data, it's from Kaggle. Um, it's in Databricks data set, so you don't actually have to load it. So I just ran a bunch of stuff where basically I created a parquet version of the table and I created a delta version of the table, okay? That's it. And by the way, if you have existing parquet tables, you can just literally run the command convert to delta and you can convert that, okay? I ran it about you know 30 minutes ago, so it's not a relatively new thing so far, okay? So I also have these streaming functions. The whole purpose is I'm going to be streaming data into the parquet table and into the Delta table. This is the part of the demo I was saying that why asset transactions are important and how Delta is a streaming uh, batch sync, okay? So now, uh, and this is just to show the fact that the parquet data and the Delta data are exactly the same. Uh, in this part of the demo, I'm just showcasing the fact that I'm using parquet as a header uh, and Delta as a header, just to say, you can literally query by the file string uh, the file path, excuse me. By the same token, if you merge with a catalog of some type, yes, you can still query your Delta tables or Parquet tables by just using the catalog as opposed to the file path. You have both options, okay? And so, all right, now let me go ahead and run this. So this, this is the function where I'm just gonna go ahead and run load data into a Parquet table, okay? So that streaming is initializing. It's important if you're gonna run this demo yourself, you wanna wait a couple seconds just for the streaming to initialize. And so you can definitely tell by looking at the UI here, basically that, okay, now data is going in. That's why that is at 73.2 records per second and the batch duration is about 1.2 seconds. Okay, so far so good. And if I run this query next, you'll notice that basically data is going in 190 rows, so far so good. All right, but how about if I try to run a second stream into that data? All right, so I'm gonna run the exact same thing. I'm just simply specifying stream number two, but there should be no difference, right? So I'll, I'll take a look at the count and it's steadily going up, but that's probably from the first one here, as you can tell from the input processing rate and the batch duration. But if I look at this one, you notice that while there is a batch duration, it's only 380 milliseconds and there's no data going in. And that's actually an issue that's, core, uh, that's specific to the fact that when you're dealing with things like Parquet or, or any other quote unquote regular uh, storage system and uh, file system, you actually, you're going to run into issues basically where because you don't have asset transactions to protect the data, you actually can't run multiple streams to write to the same table. It's not possible. And there's also the issue of potentially running into corruptions of that data, okay? So I'm just gonna let it run a couple more seconds just to, so you can see what's going on. But yes, rows are still going in, but there's nothing happening on the second stream. It's all happening on the first stream. Okay, so now let me stop all the streams and continue the process. Now, I'm gonna do the exact same exercise except I'm gonna use Delta Lake to do this. Okay, so, so we'll start this process again. All right, uh, same function. I just simply specified the table formats Delta as opposed to Parquet. And I specified uh, uh, basically a different path for where I want to store this information. Uh, uh, that's for me to check. So again, we're processing data, data is going in, same context. Uh, uh, we've got in this case 41.8 records per second, cool, 1.9 seconds batch duration. All right, no problem. And so same idea, I'm gonna run a count just to see what's going on. And sure enough, there's a bunch of rows going in, but what's great about Delta Lake and the uh, with the context of acid transactions to protect the data, I can go ahead and run multiple streams. I'm actually adding a second and I'm adding a third stream right away, okay? And as this opens up, Right, what you'll notice already, there's records going in. You'll notice here's stream three. Stream two uh, is still trying to run, I think, but uh, it happens. Well, there, oh, there you go, 44.9 seconds records per second, okay? And if you recall, if we go back here, this is what the stream two for per K was, no, no new rows inside here. But stream two, one, two, and three, hopefully I didn't just give you guys vertigo for spinning up and down the notebook so quickly. Um, basically there's all rows constantly going in. And so for that matter, I can do a quick count and I'll see the row count and it'll be significantly larger, okay? Even uh, for the less same amount of time. Okay, let me stop all the streams. Demo's almost over by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, okay? And so the when we review the streams and we look at Parquet, what you'll notice is that there's basically one bar term, okay? And the one bar here, basically will showcase um, 
I'll go figure this query would take the longest. Okay. <laughs> there's about uh, almost a thousand rows and it, there's only one stream in there. What you'll find interesting is that when I run the Delta table, not only are there three bars because each to represent the three streams, zero, you know, one, two, and three, but there's also a zeroth stream. Now this happened because the initial data wasn't actually a, it wasn't actually a stream. This day it was 50 rows that I initially had put into the table. Uh, if you query back to the top of it, that, that's actually how we started. Well, there were 50 rows of data. And then what happened is that, okay, well, when there's a new stream, there's new data coming in. Okay, no problem. So that's why you see one, two, three. But why didn't Parquet notice that? Well, what happened is that, that there's actually technically a corruption in data. It actually overwrote the initial 50 rows of data. That's why you don't see a stream zero here. Stream one actually overwrote stream zero. So th that's bad, right? And so this is what we're, this is just a small example of that idea of schema enforcement uh, and uh, evolution over time if you need evolution as well. And so this is just a relatively simplistic example, but this is that concept of single table transactional consistency that Delta Lake provides. Now I'm gonna, uh, before I shift it over to, for, to you, Paul, so it, oh, just you know, 10 more seconds, this notebook actually has all other examples like audit, uh, audit history. I'm not gonna run all these because I, I really wanted to go focus on the Lake FS part of things. But the point is that there's all this, this demo notebook, I'll, like I said, I'll give it out, uh, you can use it. It actually has all the other features of Delta Lake all packed in there. And if you're wondering, Yes, you can run this. Uh, I have a, the notebook is running in uh, Databricks. You can run in Databricks Community Edition, which is free, but you can take all the code base and run it in Delta OSS without any problem as well. Okay, so saying that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Paul, why don't we switch over to you and we can talk about multi-table transaction consistency. Of course. <clears throat> um, that was great. Uh, thanks for warming the crowd. Uh, for me, I'm going to share my screen as well, which we will start on the same slide that you left off on. So let's get to present mode. All right, let me know if anything doesn't look as it should. But um, so as Denny was saying, um, like Delta is truly fantastic for the uh, atomic transactions and consistency that it provides for a single table. It is the case that in some situations, it's useful to extend these features or guarantees uh, across multiple tables. And this is possible with a tool like, like this is possible with LakeFS, which <clears throat> lets you treat your data lake house in many ways as if it were a Git repository. And what do I mean by this? Well, if you install LakeFS, create a repo, as we call it, you'll, you'll see that we, we borrow <clears throat> essentially as many Git terms uh, as we can. So you install LakeFS, create a repository. I called mine my repo in this diagram and add your Delta tables into it. You can now uh, take commits over the repository, which uh, saves a snapshot of all your tables for a specific point in time that you can reference with a generated commit ID. Additionally, you can uh, add new data uh, atomically uh, from multiple tables. So the way this works is first you create a branch, which is a it's like a copy of your main data set, but it's a purely metadata operation that uh, doesn't at least initially copy the data. <clears throat> On this branch, you can add data, uh, you know, write new data or add data to as many Delta tables as you want, and then perform a merge operation to save the changes back to the main branch. This, uh, this atomically exposes the new data to any consumers reading the uh, main branch and guarantees a consistent view across the tables. And this is the main, like this is really the fundamental concept that I want to communicate here today. And um, additionally, I will uh, show a demo at the end of this talk of uh, this functionality, 
also with a uh, what we call a pre-merge hook, which is a which runs an arbitrary um, data validation test that will fail the merge operation if it doesn't pass and allow the merge operation to occur if it does pass. Uh, so before we get into that, I would like to give some context of how LakeVest works and what the integration looks like. So the answer is it's all metadata. And um, you know, knowing this audience, I think this uh, metaphor will make sense. So very similar to the way that Delta Lake has a transaction log, which is a small piece of metadata that is stored alongside your data. Uh, LakeFS similarly manages uh, what we call a thin layer of metadata. This uh, is a two layer B tree that keeps track of which files are contained in each commit essentially. And the details are not really important unless you really wanna you know, dive into the details, which uh, you can check out our blog and get uh, as low level as you want. But um, this thin layer of metadata wraps your object storage to provide the additional data versioning functionality like branching, committing, and merging, reverting, et cetera. Uh, it's important to know that LakeFS exposes a S3 compatible API, which means that any tool that knows how to read and write from S3, like Spark, for example, uh, can pretty easily sort of already knows how to read and write from an object store wrapped by LakeFS. So the way this works is uh, there's really two things to configure or change if you want to integrate uh, LakeFS and Delta. This is kind of from a like Databricks specific um, <clears throat> configuration, although it, it, might, it might be the same on just regular Spark. So first are a couple Spark configs to set. Um, here's the really like the, the main ones. They are set on the repo level, I wanna call out. And the most important one is this S3 API endpoint. Um, this will point to the URL of your LakeFS, your LakeFS's installation. And uh, you know, for example, on Databricks, they, these are you know can be set like the advanced options, uh, you know, little text box. Uh, additionally, in your code, uh, you'll update any reference to the object storage that you have, you know, like a S3 bucket and and file prefix. So instead of pointing to the bucket, the change you make on the location, in this this code example, is to uh, instead of the bucket, point to the LakeFS repository that wraps the bucket. And you will also have uh, a branch as part of the path to, to you know, work on. And really those are the, you know, you, you make these changes, these small changes, and otherwise you can pretty much read and write data uh, in the same way you already do, but with this uh, ability to be version aware. So to recap, uh, very simply, add your, you can add your Delta tables into LakeFS repositories and use Git inspired operations to provide atomicity on transactions that span across multiple tables. And uh, that said, it is time to hop into a demo that I have prepared. So, See if I can move some of the Zoom <clears throat> screen sharing stuff. So we are in a Databricks notebook and we're going to do the, uh, the demo I mentioned briefly before. Uh, so first of all, this notebook is configured in the way I showed to point to a uh, LakeFS installation. We can see the, the LakeFS UI uh, here, this is uh, this is the UI. It shows the repositories I've created. You can uh, just add a couple 
just to create a new one, uh, you just add the name, the essentially the bucket it uh, will point to, and the default branch name. So what we're going to do in this demo is read in the same uh, lending club or like lending data, loans data that uh, Denny used in his demo. And we're going to create, uh, we're going to split it into two tables. One, a dimension table that is uh, essentially a list of the states contained in the loans. And the other is more of like a fact table of all the uh, individual like loan detail instances. Uh, we're going to save them as Delta tables on a branch in a lake best repo. Uh, we're going to insert a bad record into one of the tables that has a bad state name. And then we're going to go into the lake of SUI, commit and try to merge the data. Uh, we'll see that the merge will fail because it doesn't pass our data validation test. Um, then we're going to delete the bad record, redo the, the merge, and all should succeed. Uh, before I start, I do want to point to um, you know, this blog post that goes into uh, we published it um, like a couple months ago. It goes into a bit more of the details that I'm going to cover of how to set up <clears throat> the like validation um, hook that'll succeed or fail the merge. So actually, first, what we want to do is go into our Delta demo uh, repository. And uh, right now, there's only one branch, which is the main branch. We're going to create a new branch to write uh, the new data to. We'll call it ingest. So we create this branch, and now it's run through this notebook. So we're going to load the data into a data frame, all uh, one and a half million rows of it, and 137 columns. So actually, similar as Danny did, we're going to turn it into a grouping by state which is really just to give us like the dimension table of which, uh, which states all 54. So there's some bad data in here, but uh, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, this is a, a fun step to create a Delta table pointing to uh, our LakeFS repository on the ingestion branch and we'll save it uh, in this location. So we can run that. Uh, so the first table is created. Uh, we should see, I didn't, uh, if we go to, we can look uh, in, in, the, in the, uh, the UI. I didn't confirm that, but essentially, you know, you can see the, you might've been able to see the changes we just saved. Um, so let's create the second table. This is the fact table of all the loans. We're gonna set the addresses to a, mostly to a good address or state address of New Jersey, but we're gonna create uh, one that has a bad state address. Uh, so we created this Delta table loan details, and we're gonna insert a bad record that has uh, NJ and J as the state address. And all right, this has been added. And basically what we wanna do now, <clears throat> so we should see, okay, great. So we do have some uncommitted changes now on the ingestion branch of this repo. Let's go ahead and commit these. Uh, I will note that I am using the LakeFS UI for the commit and merge, but uh, you can similarly, you know, we have a CLI, you can run all these sorts of operations. And similar to what Denny mentioned, we also have like, uh, uh, like Rust bindings that has a Python, you know, wrapper to create like a, a Python API as well. All right, so we, uh, we committed our, our loan tables. Now let's try merging them from the main branch and sorry from the yeah from the ingest branch into the main branch let's go like this okay so we see our our file changes uh there's both a data file and uh delta log changes 
it's, uh, you know, both are equal, let's say, in, in LakeFS's view. They're both just files. So we can write merge. Let's try to perform the merge. This, when I, I trust it, uh, takes a few seconds. Um, so I will say that uh, I heard it described the other day, the LakeFS UI as being sort of like a combination of like an object store and Git, which um, is kind of interesting. So on the actions tab, we can see the results of these pre-merge validation checks. Uh, the one we just ran is just finished. So you can see it failed. This uh, means that the merge operation did not happen. There was bad data. Any data that uh, you know that's under most workflows would have gotten into production and potentially caused all these errors. Now it fails and isn't exposed on the main branch, which most production consumers should read from. And what we can do is very simply, in this case, just uh, go back into our notebook, delete the bad record, and delete it a few rows. And we can, let's, let's retry the uh, merge. So do the merge from ingest to main. And yes. So uh, while this does run for a couple seconds, the way this is working to give you some sense is <clears throat> we have this uh, separate notebook, which is the validation notebook. And it runs, I call it an arbitrary uh, you know, data validation or quality check. So you could put any type of query you want here. Here I'm um, you know, left joining the two tables and seeing that there's no, um, you know, there's no uh, record where the address state in one of the tables is null, which would indicate that there was a state that doesn't exist in the other table. And there's an assertion here. So um, you know, that's what determines it's succeeding or failing. So we can go back into Lake of SUI. It finished and uh, it passed, a little green check mark. So uh, all is well. On the main branch, we can see uh, the tables, loan details, and the loan states. So there's a little demo of some functionality. Hope this gave you a better idea and sense of uh, the workflows that LakeFS lets you enable over your data lake house. And uh, I've stopped sharing, I hope that's. Uh... Oh, that's great. Paul, thank you very much. This is super helpful. Um, we do have a couple questions and they're actually more for specifically for LakeFS. So yeah, I'll, one, I'll, I'll just direct them to you. <clears throat> and uh, yes. the, the original question, is uh, I assume LakeFS works with uh, Azure storage blobs like ADLs Gen 2. Um, is that, can you please confirm that? Yes, I confirm it. And um, yeah, so the, the object store underneath LakeFS can be Azure, can be Google, obviously S3 and even you know other, we have some users uh, having Min Mineo under the hood. Um, you know, other tools reading and writing will think that they're reading and writing from S3, I guess, based on the API. But LakeFS behind the scenes is then using, in your case, Azure to actually store you know, the, the data. So I perfect. confirm. Yep, perfect, excellent. And then another question is, uh, do we have, are there APIs to integrate the Git operations within the notebooks development environment. And so I believe that you had already answered it, but I figured I'd just go ahead and re-clarify the question, which is basically there should be, there are, excuse me, not should be, there are uh, APIs and CLI calls that you can do as opposed to necessarily doing all of this stuff directly within uh, the UI itself with a, a, when it comes to LakeFS, is that correct? That is correct. Um, I encourage uh, anyone to go to docs.lakefs.io to, um, you know, there, there's an integration section 
where you can see examples of how to do this. I, I also, will, I have this example. I think it uh, could very quickly just give, you know, people the idea, the picture of what it looks like. So, um, okay. Yeah, so this, this is a Python notebook. Um, we have a, a pip installable LakeFS client. Um, these are not real AWS keys. I was aware of that. So once you can set up this little bit of configuration, you can do, <laughs> Uh, I think the operations that uh, you're asking, like uh, branches, uh, create branch, uh, for example, the make a commit. So that's uh, that is certainly something you can do. Perfect. Okay. Code. So we got time for one more question, and I, I sort of like this one. Uh, without very without specifically. Diving into the B tree, though. In fact, I, I wouldn't mind diving into that, but the, I'll, I'll, I'll do that later. But what happens when you have two concurrent operations working on the same set of records, like your read, write, read, write situations uh, through Lake FS in this case, right? For, for sake of argument, where you've got like doing read, and write across multiple tables. So each individual table has their own asset transactions that are being protected by Delta Lake, but then now you're doing read and write for two concurrent ones through like FS. How does that actually, how do you handle that actually? Yeah, so it's a good, it's a good question. Um, essentially, I would say that, uh, I, I think it's maybe it's correct to say like they're, they're responded to by the LakeFS server, uh, which keeps track of what's being, of what's been written. And so anything reading uh, from a specific branch will, uh, will only point to the, the, the latest files that have been saved. Um, Obviously, if you take a commit, then uh, you can you know read from that specific commit. But um, you know that uh, what what technically goes on behind the scenes, I uh, maybe don't have a, a great answer to right now. But uh, we definitely have users that uh, that do a pretty high level of throughput, you know, concurrent operations happening, and. You know, I think the answer is they're just they're ordered by by the LakeFS server, and uh, 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 it 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 ensures that like while one operation is is writing, you won't read from uh, like the midpoint of that operation occurring. So, the 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 operations themselves are atomic in the same way that uh, Delta Lake makes them on a Delta table. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. So just, just to provide a little context, just because I, I happen to know a little bit about how LakeFS works. The, mm -hmm. Don't forget also, the, the fact is it, underneath the covers, LakeFS is using a B-tree, right? So basically it's a self-balancing tree, very common within database systems. So in other words, so it can actually figure out which transaction is associated with the transaction at that higher level, because at the Git branch level. And so you've got basically the Git branch level protecting the data at that higher level, right, at the Git level. And you've got Delta Lake basically protecting the data at that lower acid level, right? So basically combining the two together, you, it allows you to basically protect systems um, all throughout. So obviously, at some point, you, we can figure out if somebody's going to be able to push the system, both systems down. But uh, yeah. I, 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 yeah, but by the same token, you know, we feel comfortable. Uh, at least, at least I can say from a Delta Lake perspective, we feel comfortable saying that. Yeah, yeah, we, we've we have pretty large customers and with massively large petabytes of data that tried to push it down, and we're okay. So. <laughs> Cool. Well, I think that's it for today. Uh, I apologize for not getting to everybody's questions, but uh, we do actually have to jet right now. So, but if you do have uh, more questions, definitely join the Delta, uh, Delta Lake user Slack, actually, because both Paul and myself are actually on it. And so we'll actually answer questions. There is actually a LakeFS channel too. So you can definitely chime questions there. So, feel, so we apologize for not answering all of your questions right from the get-go, but yes, we'll be there. You can call us out. We're, we'll be happy to go ahead and uh, answer your questions then, okay? And so, uh, Paul, thank you very much. Karen, why don't you close the show, please?
Sure. Thanks, Denny. Thanks so much again, Paul. Um, Denny, great session. Uh, so I dropped the recording link in Zoom and LinkedIn. So uh, that is available for you. And apologies, everyone, for the YouTube stream. We ended up having to create a new event. So um, sorry about the confusion uh, between the two two events. Uh, but I think I think we're all set. Uh, the recording's available, and you should have the links. And um, yeah, feel free to ping either of them in uh, the GitHub or the GitHub um, in the Slack Delta Lake Slack. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Take care. Take care. Thank you.